a very warm welcome to all of you today today is our ninth seminar in our seminar series and a very good afternoon to all of you joining from uk and europe good morning to the folks joining from the us i saw a couple of registrations from georgia and atlanta and uh, good evening to all of you joining in from india southeast asia and a very late good evening to anyone joining from australia and new zealand um so today uh, let me introduce our uh, seminar series which is on the digital future for business and society perspectives on ai challenges and opportunities this is hosted jointly by professor yogesh divedi who is professor of digital marketing and innovation founding director of the emerging markets research center and co-director of research at the school of management swansea university wales uk and our co-host is professor ramakrishnan raman director symbiosis institute of business management pune and dean faculty of management at symbiosis international deemed university this seminar series is supported by the center for technology innovation management and enterprise the university of kent digital marketing and analytics special industry group academy of marketing grenoble ie graduate school of management a grenoble inp school of the university of grenoble arts swansea i lab innovation lab at swansea university the e business and the e government special industry group at the british academy of management and the uk academy of information systems to tell you a little bit about this seminar series this is actually inspired by various perspectives on artificial intelligence and its transformative potential which were presented in a recent perspective article by divedi et al 2019 AI undoubtedly offers a huge transformative potential for the augmentation and even potential replacement of human tasks and activities with within a wide range of industrial social and intellectual applications the pace of change for this AI technological age is staggering and new breakthroughs in algorithmic machine learning and autonomous decision making actually create new opportunities for continued innovation the impact of ai can be wide ranging and significant with industries and sectors ranging from agriculture finance healthcare manufacturing retail supply chain logistics utilities all of them could be potentially disrupted by the onset of ai technologies This seminar series will present various perspectives from a number of leading expert speakers to highlight the opportunities and challenges posed by the rapid emergence of AI. Allow me now to introduce to all of you our guest speaker for today, Professor Yankin Tuan. Professor Yan Kin Duan is a professor of information systems and director of business and information systems research center at the business school university of bedfordshire uk her principal research interest is the development and use of emerging icts and their impact on organizational performance decision making and knowledge transfer She is a regular expert evaluator for various major funding bodies. Professor Duan has led and participated in many research projects on digital transformation and digital agriculture and aquaculture in collaboration with international European as well as UK partners. She has received many research grants from various funding sources such as European Commission Innovate UK UK Department for International Development BBSRC GISC British Council and many others she has published over 240 peer reviewed articles 
including papers in the European Journal of Operational Research, European Journal Information Systems, European Journal of Marketing, IEEE Transaction on Engineering Management, Information and Management, the Information Society Journal of Business Research, and Industrial Marketing Management. Professor Duan will share her thoughts with us today on how AI and human decision makers can work together for better decision making, emerging challenges and research opportunities. Professor Duan, welcome to our seminar series. The floor is all yours. Dear Professor Sandeep, thank you very much for your introduction. And also thank you for all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts today. And thank you all. Okay, I am going to focus on my talk about the AI applications in decision-making. I mean, I understand this theory has covered a quite wide range of AI-related emerging issues. So my talk is mainly focused on decision-making, okay? So what I'm going to cover in this like 40 minutes talk, first, just very, very brief introduction to AI and decision-making. And then I would like to share some of my reflections from our previous research, because a lot of issues which happened maybe in the second wave of AI about 30 years ago, still seems applicable even now. So I would like to share some of that feedbacks from that with you today. I think based on that, and also based on the recent research, I would like to highlight the challenges and most importantly, research, opp research opportunities in this sense, okay? I put this slide with a very nice picture that is actually one of our campuses in, in, in University of Bedfordshire. My office actually is here. So I really, you know, the lockdown, we all been stay home these days and this is really where I miss the, the nice campus. So what this, a beautiful campus. <laughs> yeah, okay. So anyone have opportunities to visit our university can have a chance to see this very nice campus actually. Okay, so I think uh, AI, we don't need the introduction here, but I just very, very briefly to outline some key relevant points. Yeah, AI has been in exist for many years. Yeah, but it's, you know, it started like 1950s, 60s. But why AI is getting so popular now? I mean, we all understand, we call, I call it AI being revitalized due to big data, advanced algorithms, and uh, most importantly, improved computer power and storage. I have my personal experience because I did research on AI 30 years ago with my PhD. Yeah, sounds I'm very old, but <laughs> okay. So the take up of the new AI in organizations is expanding. So AI is transforming every sector, there's no doubt, yeah. So if I use the most recent findings from McKinsey's global survey on the state of AI, it reveals 50% of respondents report that their company have adopted AI in at least, at least one business functions, okay. So that is the most recent survey. However, there's another global survey conducted by MIT Slow Management Review and the BCG. It's also called like Global AI Survey. And those survey, both surveys covered like about 3,000 responses and uh, covered many industry sectors and uh, over 100 countries, yeah. So the MIT and BCG survey revealed only 10% of companies obtained significant financial benefit with AI technologies. So this, these are the most recent number, but the 10% the is not a very high number here. So we will talk about a little bit more from the reflections from their research, okay? So 
So because our my talk is focused on decision making, so just briefly introduction to AI for decision making. I mean, AI was first actually emerged as a decision making machine. So it's a chess player. You play chess, you constantly make a decision which move you, you go. So we, 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 we all say AI for decision making has been, has been and will remain one of the most important applications of AI. Yeah. So AI has experienced up and down. We call it AI spring, AI spring and winter. I joined AI spring when I decided to do a PhD about more than 30 years ago. And uh, at that time, AI, I did see the limitations of AI and AI to some extent didn't leave to the hypes we, we were expected at the time. However, this new wave of AI based on big data is claimed to be, to be able to deal with more complex tasks. Yeah. I mean, previously we said AI can't do the tasks that require cognitive capabilities. And now AI seems to be able to sense emotion to make tacit judgment. So we argue AI can help employees to reach better decisions and to boost our analytical capabilities and even strengthen creativity. So AI is actually be able to do more than, you know, like second wave is you know, what if I can call it the third wave. So, okay, because of we're talking about decision making, I thought it might be helpful to just very briefly just bring some of the relevant theories in relation to decision making. I mean, decision making is a huge topic, yeah. There are many theories from psychology, from other side, other disciplines. But here I bring up some relevant theories mainly from information system perspective. Yes, we have, I have been doing research in the, from the information system and management perspective for years. So those are the theories in relation to decision making. And we talk about tacit knowledge and explicit, explicit knowledge. I remember Professor John Edwards in his talk, he talked about, you know, about explainability of AI. He talked about tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge. Yeah. I mean, AI used to be argued not very good of dealing with tacit knowledge. But I think all this new power given to AI made, made us to think again about you know, how AI can be used for decision making. And so we have test knowledge, explicit knowledge. We also talk about intuitive and the rational decision making style. Yeah. So rational is more like logical, analytical, reasoned style, and the intuitive is more gut feeling. Yeah. And or tacit based. And also we talk about this making process. The most well known is Simon's four phases, ranging from intelligence, like business intelligence, you search the environment, trigger your need to make decision, to design the choices and make the choice and implement your decision and evaluate it. Yeah. So the decision making processes, this is more towards rational kind of process. Yeah. And the decision making levels, we're always talking about three levels, operational, technical, and tactical, and uh, strategic. This is well known. This is all re related to our understanding of AI for decision making. I will relate to this later on as well. And the types of decisions. Again, this is very well known terms, unstructured decisions to structured decisions. So these are the relevant theories when we look at AI for decision making. Yeah. We all know, as human beings, we do have certain limitations when we make decisions. I mean, we, you know, we, we, these are the examples, actually. We, as human beings, we have limited mental power, yeah? Especially with this information overlap, overload error. I just found if I buy, if I want to buy a mobile phone, too many choices. I, I just sometimes just, uh, just tell me which one I should buy and I will take it. So we have limited mental computational power. And also we are facing very high uncertainty, very complex circumstances. Yeah, and we have limited time. So this is just some examples. So in this case, we do constantly seeking help 
to make better decisions. Okay. So we all, if I ask you the questions, I mean, if in the normal kind of seminar, I will ask people to raise hands, ask the questions about your, your thinking of decision making. For example, say, would you like AI to make decisions for you without your intervention? I don't know. <laughs> I can see Sandy, if you are shaking your hands, shaking your hands. <laughs> so I think, I, yeah, I did try this. I think most of people will say no. And uh, in general, you, you know, like I said, we make decision without your intervention. That is, uh, you know, the kind of, you know, people will think, mm, no. So if no, why? Yeah. Okay. So if I ask, would you like AI to assist you in making decisions, assisting you? I mean, the answers most of the time say yes. <laughs> you are not the only one. I mean, this is a case, yes. But how? In what kind of situation? What role? What? There's lots of other questions to follow after this. So this is exactly what we need to examine. Yeah. So this question, if I ask 30 years ago, people gave me this answer. But even now, you would expect the answer may change. But actually, if I talk about it later on about the research, it's still a similar answer. I mean, AI is so powerful now, but why is still like this? So that's the things we need to understand, actually. Yeah. So 30 years ago, Professor John Edwards, who actually delivered a talk a few weeks ago, I could publish a paper, outline the role of AI for decision making. Yeah, I mean, I use John's because as I've been, maybe people don't know, John was my PhD supervisor. So, you know, John actually has been doing research in this area for years. So in this, in 30 years ago, he outlined the role of AI in decision making could be assistant. I mean, in this case, so AI is just your, your assistant. You, instruct AI, do whatever you do, or search information for me, give me this data, all these kind of things. Or AI can be a critique. So you have decisions, they can evaluate, give you the feedback and the critique. Or AI can give you second opinion. And you said, oh, this is the best of my memo. I don't think, I think maybe you should try another one. Or in a higher level, AI is expert. You respect AI, you ask AI, tell me what I need to do and explain why, yeah? Or AI is like your teacher. You learn from AI and then you become better decision makers. And then the extreme case, okay, automation. You just let AI to make decisions for you without your intervention. I mean, this cartoon says, if you want a second opinion, I will ask my computer. So <laughs> could be a in the case actually, yeah. So this is about 30 years ago. I will reflect this again at uh, near the end about the, similar situation proposed by BCG and MIT survey, actually. So I, can, I, will, I would like to just share some reflections from our previous research. And I choose three uh, kind of research we, I did. And the first one is experiments on the use of expert systems. And expert systems is a kind of artificial intelligence systems. And that one is we use expert system to manage a simulated manufacture company. No company will let you to do, to do experiment, real experiments with AI. No company said, okay, I will agree to do experiment. Let AI manage my company, how it goes. That's quite impossible. So that's why we use the experiments, yeah? So that's, uh, this actually done about 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, with my PhD. So we, I did experiments to use AI to manage a man simulated company. Yeah. As I said, you can't let a real company to do that. So these are competitive business game. AI actually replaced the managers, managing this company. So it's typical decision making using AI. Yeah. And the second one, second example is reflect a group of research we developed in collaboration with the people in China, we developed and used expert system for agriculture and ag agriculture and uh, to help farmers in uh, like say disease diagnosis and management. And the third research, 
actually was my PhD student's research to understand the senior executive's views and perceptions on the use of personal intelligent agent, it's kind of personal AI actually, to help them process information and make decision. So they all focus on decision making, okay? So I just want to share some kind of the reflections based on this. I mean, these are the, this screen just shows the publications we made actually, yeah? So it's just showing all the way through, we have been, do, we have been doing research about understanding decision-making. And all I want to say is the issues rise still same now even, yeah? So for example, I, in this paper like published in 1992, one of them, 1995, they all talk about using AI for decision-making. One is used for as, as advisory, like an assistant role. And then also this paper, this, oh, sorry. The one here is actually published in the European Journal of Information Systems. I could analyze the role in different levels of the organizational management, yeah. The decisions actually covered a wide range in, in these experiments, from sales to production, to marketing, to procurement, to r &D. You need to make a decision about price, materials, supply chain management. So it, it tried to reflect a real company situation. Okay. For the agricultural export systems, we also use them to help the extension list and farmers. And we learned quite a lot from our real application. This is a real application case, yeah? So we, one of perspective, we try to understand knowledge transfer, yeah? How use of AI can help transfer knowledge from expert to no expert, yeah? And a third research I'm trying to share here, is more a kind of qualitative, qualitative research. We interviewed, we did focus groups and interviewed senior executives. We say, okay, just ideally, we will give you an idea, AI software, what do you want from it? And or if we want to design one, what is your idea criteria? So this AI can do whatever you want, but tell me what you want him to do or his, her to do, I mean, agent, yeah, what did to do, okay? So this is um, another research we published papers in the expert system with applications. So all this research, I highlight some of the interesting feedbacks here, which still useful in guide our current work, yeah? So this, this is just very uh, small examples about benefit we collected from our users, yeah? Say, the first one, when we do the experiments, the AI seems doing very good at operational and tactical levels, but has limitations at strategic level. Is this still the case now? Yes, I think so. It's still some, you know, some, I will talk, some research still show, you know, it's quite difficult, challenging to use AI to make strategic decisions, yeah? And also the, the, the users mentioned the system helped to make sense of mass of data. This is 30 years ago, yeah? I mean, can we all talk about big data now. It seems this is very important benefit, make sense of mass of data, yeah? The system was very good at getting me out of trouble quickly. This is experiments we gave to students to use expert system as an advisory system, yeah? So that also helps us reverse some poor decisions and get us on the right track, good one, yeah. And also students say, although it's time consuming to use AI for advice, but we, we would make decisions and compile them to those offered by the AI. So this is like second opinion or critique, yeah. So the students think we make a decision, we want to hear what AI say as well, we can compare. And also add a different perspective and help us to keep our objective quality in mind. Yeah. So that's other, some feedback from you about benefit, but most important is about the problems and the issues here, here now, okay? So human-machine relationship in terms of this, 
the, in my experiment 30 years ago, this AI advisory system said was not able to advise in view of what our aim and strategy, strategy was. So they think, oh, you don't understand me. You don't, you don't understand our strategy. Okay. And also for one period, they said, we didn't agree with the direction the system suggested. Okay. And in the middle, we wanted to pursue other aims not covered by the system, which lead to problem. Uh, also, if AI agent is used, it shouldn't become a barrier to information flowing to me. This is another work we did with executives. They just said, if I use AI and as automation to filter in systems, I don't want them to stop some information flowing to me. This AI machine relationships, personal development concern actually has been a one very critical uh, concern, feedback actually. So people, you know, the student, no, this is not a student, it's farmers actually say, I'm not a slow learner, but you know, we have to learn by doing, okay? And also they said, we had a hiccup in our decision-making. This system helped sort us out. However, I feel we should have done this ourselves. We should have, so that's, in sum up, we want to learn from our own mistakes. Yeah, and so the, AI doesn't improve our management skills because they just said, I want to learn myself. I want to learn from my own mistakes. There are some other things about how human machine communicate. Okay. So one says the computers don't speak in a way a real expert does. I'm puzzled with the suggestions. If you say 75% possibility of having something, what should I do? So they just say, okay, you know, the computer is still machine, I can't communicate. And also the learning abilities of AI. We always found something is not covered by the computer. And we have to work together to make the system, because once the system not cover something, it's like a diet technology, they said. How to make a diet technology into a live one. So the AI constantly learn from the situation, adapt to that. Yeah. So, there's still some issues you can see rise from the users. And also with other research, I just highlight with diagrams about executive design criteria for idea software. The key message from this diagram, the key message, yeah, is, you know, on the bottom line, this is about automation, the level of intelligent support from low to high. The desire, design, the design criteria from low to high on the left side. It looks like the executives, the highest design is they want the system usability. They want the system to be personalization, uh, controllability. So they want the higher level is usability. The lower level is automation. Yeah, so you know this line? So the key message is managers want more control rather than high automation. This is based on our uh, investigations with executives. That is a key message. This has been done about 20, 15, 20 years ago as well, this key message, yeah. So this, uh, now this is a recent research just published in 2021 in the computer, computers in human behavior. Also highlighted when they done five start empirical studies with over a thousand managers. They found human managers don't want to exclude the machine entirely from managerial decision-making, but instead prefer a partnership in which humans have a majority vote. Yeah. So it seems managers strongly op oppose a partnership in which machine provide the most input into the decision-making process. See, even 30 years ago, we have the concern, and now the recent study with manager, managers still reflect the perceptions and uh, resistance in using AI in managerial decision-making. Okay. However, we argue AI has been revitalized, and like it or not, a new human-machine symbiosis is on the horizon. So the question remains how humans and the new artificial intelligence be complementary in decision-making. 
how human and machines can work symbiotically together to augment and enhance each other's capabilities. Okay. The most recent global survey from MIT and the BCG actually highlighted the key to the success. Yeah. So the key to success with AI is human machine collaboration. So collaboration instead of competition, of course. Yeah. So we understand that is the right way, but a lot of issues remain how, why, and to what extent, in what situation, in what mode, how to measure the benefit. There are lots of issues remain. Yeah. So in the um, MIT and the BCG survey, they also highlighted the different modes of the AI machine collaboration. So I listed this in comparison with John's uh, 30 years ago's proposed AI role here. Yeah. So in this survey, they highlighted five kind of human machine interaction or collaboration uh, patterns. So you can have AI generates insights, human use them in a decision process. It's like a system. Yeah? And human generates, AI evaluates, it's like a critique, yeah? And AI recommends, human decides, so human in control, AI provide assistance. AI decides, human implements, AI in control. Or to the, you know, the AI completely control, AI decides and implement, you just, without no intervention, you leave the things to AI, yeah? So they have promoted these five, modes. I mean, I have to say similar to uh, what John proposed 30 years ago as well. Okay, so we conclude in this way, human AI collaboration for smart decision making. We have smart thing for everything. I mean, we know people talking about smart decision making. Yeah. How, can I, how can we achieve human AI collaboration for smart decision making? So we are facing this argument, automation versus augmentation. Yeah. And some might even argue AI augmentation in the context of organizational decision-making is the future of AI in decision-making. So I would like to just summarize. I mean, there are lots of opportunities, lots of challenges. I just here just, just uh, explain. This are some examples of the emerging research opportunities here. Yeah. Okay. So AI for decision making at the personal level, at the personal level, yeah, we argued. Okay, human machine collaboration is the way forward. Yeah. So. However, they still need to understand how this can be done. Yeah. Mode of human AI collaboration and their application and effects depending on the situations. So the moods can change, the situation can change, but we need more in-depth understanding and examination yeah, to understand how they work. Yeah. And the factors influencing the acceptance and avoidance of using AI. All this may depend on the decision-making style you are rational or intuitive ones, the strategic and the operational ones. Yeah, this all depends on the, a lot of situations. And so maybe if I'm more like gut feeling decision maker, I mean less reluctant to use AI. Yeah, and also impact on decision making behavior. If I'm lazy one, I may just over trust AI, which may cause some other issues actually. Yeah, and another very important one is mutual learning how AI can learn from human, how human can learn from AI. It's easy to say, but it's quite difficult to, to, to do actually, yeah, based on our previous research. I do have a very big question, and I, I wrote uh, in another joint paper with, uh, you know, Rogers and other collaborators about the AI's role in the decision-making to deal with pandemic. It's disappointing to some extent, because we are facing this huge challenge, but you can see all the decision makers at a higher level, they made, they made mistakes. And I was wondering if, if we all argue AI is a superpower, why couldn't the AI help? Yeah, so how AI can rise to the challenge to empower human decision maker? 
especially you know at the beginning of pandemic the incomplete information is a huge problem because we don't know high uncertainty high risk but can ai do better in the future crisis yeah so there's still a lot to learn doing research about ai and the pandemic this is the making I'm talking about. AI has been used in many other areas in the pandemic management, which has done very well, actually. But in terms of decision making for helping, let's say, senior uh, managers or politicians, there's still a lot of challenges there. Yeah? So at the operational level, how AI is being used and coexist in organizations. And what are the critical factors for the success? Some doing well, some not well. 10% are gaining significant financial benefit. What about 90%? What about the rest? Yeah. So what are the critical success factors? And also AI people are real change and is changing the organizational culture. Yeah. And even decision making process and the hierarchical structure. AI doesn't understand the hierarchy. I don't understand the, you know, the structure. They will, so how this may be impact on this organizational behavior? Yeah, and organizational learning as well. So organizational behavior in the area of the AI. Okay. So and other areas as well. These are just examples. Dark side of AI. Yes, I will talk about dark side as well. That is completely true for decision making as well. Yeah. Will AI replace managers? That's why managers have us resistant. They all fear, if AI can do my job, what I'm going to do? This is not for just workers, uh, like flow, you know, like robots replace workers. It, will it replace, replace managers? Yeah, the, we have to address the fears. Personal development concern, this is also, if I leave AI to do things, I lose my credibility and learning ability. Yeah? Risks over trust in AI. Concerns of AI bias. We, I think that some talks covered this about bias, explainability, explain the reasoning process, ownership and control, legal issues. If AI made a decision, who are, who are it, who is should be prosecuted if something wrong? Yeah. And AI accessibility, equal opportunity. If I have AI, I can access AI, I make a better decision. How could I, other people also have equal opportunity to assess it? So many issues here as well. We call it dark side of AI, yeah? Okay, the last one. Also in terms of methodology, in terms of a theoretical development, there's still a lot of need to do, yeah? We still need to think about conceptual and theoretical advancement for explaining and measuring. How we measure when we say make a better decision? How do you measure it? How do you, you know, do, know? How do you know? Yeah. So that's lots of issues about measuring the use, benefit, and the impact. A lot of intangible ones. Yeah. And also, I really would like to see more, like, see rich empirical evidence. We have surveys, but survey have limitations. We need to have much in-depth insights. Case studies, longitudinal research, experiments, simulations, you know, all this much give different kind of perspective. Yeah. So that is still a lot we can do. I did experiments 30 years ago. I could think maybe we, you know, still possible to do some experiment in the area of more advanced stage to see how it works. Yeah. So I just give some examples to highlight the opportunities. I'm sure there are more there, but this is just examples I'm trying to share with everyone here. So I would like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators because part of this is based on the research with Professor John Edwards from Aston University and Professor Yorgos in Swansea University. I would like to thank their contributions as well. And I can't finish before with, uh, finish my talk without promoting our papers. We, John, Yogesh, we all published a paper focusing on AI in decision making uh, in the International Journal of Information Management. So there are more details if you are interested to uh, talk. Yeah. Okay. And references here. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention and the question.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Duan, for that uh, very lucid narrative on that so important intersection set between AI and human beings. And uh, I particularly enjoyed your use of one specific word in your entire presentation where you use the word symbiosis, which is the name of our university itself. Notice that, yeah. Thank you. Uh, very, very interesting insights where you referred to the positives as well as the negatives uh, and how they can possibly um, help us. And you kind of took us through that. Would we want to rely completely on AI or would we want AI to assist us? And uh, your uh, point about the pandemic is very well taken. Uh, given the mayhem that has kind of happened in many parts of the world, uh, AI certainly could have helped in a variety of areas. And one really wonders why the powers that be did not draw upon the excellent expertise which is already available in many of the developed countries of the world. But uh, that said, let's uh, move now. I can see that the chat box is buzzing with a few questions. So let me um, pick them up and then share them with you. So we have a question from Annie Tubadji, who's from Swansea University. So Annie says, thanks, Professor Duan, for the very interesting and timely talk. Could you elaborate a bit more on what is known from your research and the literature, how the use of AI affects the decision-making skills of people over time? Uh, we have cars and other transportation devices. We certainly have more obesity. What will happen with our brains and decision making if we have AI to think for us? Thank you. Thank you for an interesting question. That is a one big issue actually about the, our skills and uh, by you, where we are using AI. And there are positive ones definitely as well and the negative one. The positive ones by using AI, people actually do improve their skills. And I mean, examples with like um, um, advisory system, yeah. You know, before, you know, the call center people, when people, are they all supported by some kind of AI system. You know, when you ask questions like uh, chatbot as well, you type your inquiries, it's all AI helping them to give the answers actually. But gradually some staff actually say, this is based on my literature review, actually, Gradually, they learn by using, initially, they don't know they, they search the AI. Then, gradually, learn they don't have to use such AI. They, they can answer directly themselves. They learn from that. But uh, there are also some issues people, uh, so when we do experiments, the students feel they, the using AI slowed their learning process because they can't learn from their own mistakes. And they feel if they don't learn by this way, when they face another different situation, they make, still make those mistakes. So it's, it's not a straight answer, say, you know, yes and, uh, yes and no. It, have I answered that question? I think so. I think so, Professor Duan. And uh, you also briefly referred to, in your talk, uh, playing chess. Um, there have been huge advances in uh, computer-based chess players. And um, it, it takes the system, the AI system, just a few hours to learn. And then you can put the champions, the grandmasters of the world in front of the computer and chances are the computer wins, surely because of the volume of uh, yeah. information and data that is contained. Yeah, I think so. You know, the, the first time when the AI beat the chess player, I think it's 1997, Deep Blue. And yes. I'm very excited to wake up in the morning. That is the first time human be beaten by machine. That's right. That's right. And if I recall, that was the existing champion of the world at that point in time, Gary Kasparov. He got beaten by the deep blue IBM supercomputer playing chess. Yeah. 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 Wonderful example. Um, just to share a use case, uh, Professor Duan and our participants, I teach this case in one of my classes. Uh, there's a very interesting case study by Unilever where they have started using AI for recruitment of fresh college graduates all over the world. And they ran this as a pilot in 2018, 2019 on a quarter of a million uh, candidates. Uh, so they use two pieces of software. I think they are called as HireView and Prometric. 
and uh, they used ai to do the entire process of long listing short listing cv verification from the linkedin profiles a uh, video assessment based upon keywords intonations and body language and finally ended up with giving a shortlisted set of candidates to the hiring managers who then physically interviewed each person and uh, they cut the cycle time from 4 months to 4 weeks and uh, recruiter time uh, they uh, brought it down by 75% um so it kind of uh, alludes to some of the aspects that you referred to about uh, how different use cases where humans and ai are working together it can actually not just help the decision making but perhaps even reduce the process cycles yeah that's a very good example maybe for some of the mode here ai decide human implements so the ai gave you the short list and uh, but i in this case humans still have the final say yeah they they have to make make or ai recommend a human decide the the only concern i may have is because ai is a use algorithm is a machine you know program i just wonder for a long time why the people will learn from this program they play with it indeed one hopes they will learn and uh, we we hope that uh, it the if the learning can be helped by uh, the ai based processes so professor duan our next question is from galina kondrateva so galina kondrateva is asking us thank you for the very interesting talk professor duan i am wondering have you done some research on regulations that should be updated for protection in case of ai biases is it still always the responsibility of the human in case of wrong decisions example broadly discussed ai recruitment system that discriminated some candidates this is a very and very i'm assuming this question is not related to my case study <laughs> <laughs> i think this is a very very important question and uh, difficult to answer as well yeah I mean, in general, we definitely need strengthened regulation with AI applications. And uh, but I think there are still unknown, and uh, in terms of this area, the we haven't seen any big case about the. the potential issues i mean the issues with the legal side i mean that you on the one side a you know there sometimes hand in hand actually yes yeah? so if some the, the regulation will improve to pre- protect you know uh, protect the, the 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 society in in terms of the legal side if i understand the question right is that the okay. regulation for ai applications is that right that's right that's right so she is asking whether the regulation should be updated for protection in case of ai biases i mean the answer is is definitely yes and uh, there, there is perhaps another angle to think about here which is when we are actually creating the ai system i mean ai basically is a set of rules a rule based system into which learning is kind of superimposed as a layer and we are when we are creating those systems perhaps we can even program in the removal of bias or non uh, to make sure that biases don't operate in fact in this very same unilever case study that i talked about they ran a report after the uh, usage of the ai and they compared it with the past years where human beings had made the decisions and they actually found that they had hired their most diverse batch across mm-hmm. almost 50 years of recruitment thanks mm-hmm. to the fact that they had built in the elimination of bias in those ai programming rules so it was mm-hmm. quite a fascinating case and if um, any of our participants are interested they can just google uh, unilever comma ai comma recruitment and it will throw up the case study uh, for them with the complete uh, detail so um, i just thought i'll share that in the context of this uh, question 
Um, That's a very good example, actually. Yeah. So thank you. Instead of AI bias, but AI actually can learn because AI yes. is okay to process huge amount of data to eliminate or to minimize the bias. Yeah. Indeed. Mm -hmm. So our next question, Professor Duan, is from Eleni Leo Liu. Um, so Eleni is asking, thank you so much for this fascinating talk, four exclamation marks, too many questions and too little answers. Uh, I wanted your thoughts on the issue of transparency. As a consumer, I do not feel that I'm ever aware of who has access to my data and how it is being used. High-tech companies are overriding privacy and human rights experts. Can you tell us from your own research whether governments are monitoring the use of data by high-tech companies or whether high-tech companies are too powerful actors to control? Oh, that's a very big question again. And uh, I, I would like to, to maybe, I mean, others you can share as well. This is a big issue. On the one hand, we want to, in, we want to enjoy or benefit from the technology. Yeah. On the other hand, we want to protect our privacy. And the technology needs data to be powerful, to deliver the benefit. But on the other hand, there are limits, there are boundaries to how you can access the data. So it's, it's like a trade-off. But, but the definitely government have a much strong control about privacy. What data you can use. And also, I said it's a trade-off of the balance between and the society, what kind of data you want to give in terms to, to gain from that. Yeah. So this is a huge issue again, data protection. And uh, there are lots of problems, I know, in that sense, especially AI. I mean, if I want to make a very personal uh, information, that, I mean, personal, if I want to that help you in a very personal way, so I said I want to AI to help me to buy a property or buy a mobile phone. They maybe ask a lot of the personal data, the data of myself. And so there's, a, there's always a dilemma and uh, uh, you know what, you have to decide what you want to gain and what you want to gain. But the, in the higher level, yes, definitely it's a concern. Thank you. Um, our next question is from uh, Giles Robertson. And I'm saying Giles in French, it would be Gilles. Uh, so I'm assuming um, it's Giles. So Giles is asking, building on regulation questions, Stephen Hawking and Tesla's Elon Musk have warned that AI could ultimately lead to the destruction of humanity if the right checks and balances are not put in place. Do you have a view on these systems could, would, should work? That's another very big question, yeah. I know they are very different. I, I, you know, I used to start the talk with some very contradictory, you know, marks. I mean, Elon Musk is another, you know, the figure. They are very optimistic and very pessimistic views, yeah. And uh, I'm more towards optimistic side in this sense. I, I, I don't think AI yeah, will destroy the. The, the, you know, the, the, the human uh, future, uh, this thing. So I don't know how to answer this kind of question, actually. Yeah. Well, I would certainly tend to agree yeah, with you, Professor Duan, because uh, uh, human beings are building AI. So if uh, the human mind is so devious that they are trying to actually uh, program killing mechanisms, <laughs> then, then God help us. Yes, Professor Yogesh, please do come in. Yeah, I guess it's, it's like any other weapon that we have, like atomic bomb, yeah? yeah. So if you want to use it, of course, it, it will destroy it um, without any uh, second. But, but, you know, same atomic energy being used for different uh, constructive purposes. Absolutely, uh, power generation. Uh, yes, absolutely. And, and AI is no different if human being will use it uh, uh, for constructive purposes, it will be really productive and helpful. But of course, same time, it has power to destroy. So if you want to use it for, for bad purposes, it will also have similar effectiveness in that area. 
So it all depends upon how human being going to uh, actually use it. And that's where AI governance comes into play. Sure. You know, it's very important that governments of various countries and at international level, AI governance is uh, clearly articulated and, uh, and controlled. So yeah, just wanted to say that. And just also want to add, um, in Annie's uh, comments earlier uh, about uh, if uh, you know if human being using AI and what effect that may have on humans' ability to make decisions by themselves, I think this is an area where definitely we need uh, we need research. Uh, now most lots of companies are implementing AI. Lots of places are AI being implemented. It's nice to do some empirical research or some experimental research, in fact, to see actually what happens when people use AI um, after a few months, after a few years. If it's experimental research, then after a few uh, maybe control things, what, what will happen? And that kind of research will be definitely, you know, well received by journals. Um, at the moment, most of the things that we talk about is anecdote. Uh, we don't know uh, how things, because things now started happening in real. In 80s and 90s, lots of research done, but it didn't go into uh, actual, uh, actual implementation. But now implementation is happening. If you go on LinkedIn and search for people, with artificial intelligence uh, uh, title, you will now find almost every company has employed someone who has AI role, yeah? So AI manager, AI implementer, AI something. And it's amazing to see how fast things are moving, actually. So I think loss and loss of scope for empirical research as a general editor, I can see I'm receiving article every week, few article on AI, and Professor Duan actually is the most helpful as an AI to handle many of those uh, articles. So, lots of scope to do research and publish on this topic, actually. I just wanted to highlight this. Yeah. Thank you. So we are at the top of the hour, but uh, Professor Duan, maybe we can take one or two questions more with your permission. Yes, of course. Yes, you are good. Okay, okay. So we have a question from um, Shin Wan Chang. So um, he, uh, Shin Wan is asking, thank you for your great presentation, Professor Duan. Just one question for recommendation system, which is an example for AI. Um, and uh, not new and widely used in different sectors. What is the new development for recommendation agents to date? Is the first question that Shinwan is asking. Oh, so, I mean, maybe we are not aware. There are lots of recommendation AI systems in exist. I mean, I mentioned examples about like chatbot and uh, call centers. I mean, it's, these days AI has been embedded. AI is invisible now. It's embedded in almost all digital systems. Yeah, and uh, as a Unilever's recruitment uh, one is a typical also to some extent his recommendation system. So this recommendation system can from lower level intelligence to a very higher level intelligence, and it it is a very important part of the. The, the current modern digital system now, especially like the customer service management, the customer relationship management. This AI make recommendations. You know, sometimes we receive the discount vouchers, discount emails. They all like recommendation system by AI. So they are recommendation systems to managers. They give them the recommendation. Yeah. So recommendation in different forms, different level of intelligence, but it's all very important part of the, the current AI applications now. And maybe it's the most important ones as well, yeah. Perhaps even the humble Amazon.com uh, uh, portal uh, 
based on the purchases we've made, uh, they start making choices and then we start seeing ads appearing of products mm. like the ones that we purchased. Mm. Yeah. So it, it goes on. Uh, in fact, yeah. Shinwan has written a follow-up question. Since Google will block third-party cookies in 2022, how does this affect AI systems to support consumer decision-making? We, we need ways to see. I mean, if they block and uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult if you don't have, you cannot access data. Right. I suppose they might be limited to the data uh, of actual purchases or mm. the browsing data that they capture because um, uh, their system can capture which pages we visited, how long we spent on which page, what products we browse through, um, staying with the Amazon example. So uh, perhaps they'll figure out uh, more intelligent ways of uh, analyzing the data that we human beings are creating every second. It's always a trade-off, yes. You know, the, <clears throat> what you can give or what you can gain, actually, yes. Absolutely. Uh, Professor Yogesh, any last thoughts? No, no, Professor Bhattacharya. I just want to say a big thank you to Professor Duan and to yourself for very well coordinating and facilitating the, the session. And I, my apologies are that I, I could not be in the session for, for, for all the time, but I can already see that loss of engagement. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Duan and Professor Bhattacharya. And uh, I think Professor Raman is not there, but my thanks also goes to him. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. So Professor Duan, heartfelt thanks uh, from all of us for a very lucid and a very um, incisive narrative on perhaps this might be actually a very, very important part that how do human beings and AI interact uh, together? Um, who takes precedence? How do decisions get made? Do we quote unquote employ AI as the most intelligent uh, employee in, in a department? and still leave the final decision making to humans. Um, and at what levels? Um, and like Professor Yogesh rightly mentioned, uh, you can use a tool uh, for good or for bad. And we, we, of course, hope that it gets uh, used better and better for good purposes. So thank you very much for a wonderful narrative, uh, Professor Duan. And I would also like to thank our co-hosts, Professor Yogesh, Professor Raman, our dear participants uh, who uh, made the discussion extremely lively with their conversations, with their questions. In fact, I could see in the chat box that even before we opened up for questions, lots of comments were flying back and forth, uh, encouraged by the points that you were making in your talk, Professor Duan. So thank you, dear participants. It was absolutely wonderful um, to have all of you here. And uh, for all participants, I must mention that this was the ninth talk. Uh, we will... We shall have our next uh, seminar on the 24th of March at one o'clock uh, UK time. This will be by Dr. Paul Walton from Capgemini of uh, UK. And uh, he will be sharing with us successful transformation with AI. I must also thank uh, our wonderful um, IT team, IT support team led by Rajesh Bhagewadi, who have enabled the entire infrastructure for the smooth conduct of all our seminars. And last but not the least, uh, Professor Duan, we actually have uh, my institute, SIVM Pune's uh, student team called iSmart, um, who have peeped in into our session. And what they do is they capture uh, snapshots of our speakers. And uh, usually within a few minutes um, of the seminar ending, uh, we send out a few thank you electronic frames, e-frames, just as a small token of appreciation. If you visited us, they would actually uh, walk up to you as you're coming down from the stage and they would hand you a photo frame with your picture on it uh, uh -huh. if you visited us in SIVM Pune. So uh, we'll send that electronically. So thank you once again um, to Professor Duan, our co-hosts, our participants. And uh, it, it's been a wonderful session. Looking forward to more such seminars. Uh, we have, I think, another six of them scheduled. So looking forward to those. Thank you all.